discussed was uh, the pill, the 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 furud or the things that are obligatory to wash during the wudu. The, the limbs that are wajib or the things that are wajib to wash or to perform during the wudu. Washing the face, the hands, wiping the head, uh, washing the feet, doing it in order, tagtib, and the sixth one being doing it in maintain or maintaining close sequence and muwala. Um, then we mentioned the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amun idha qumtum ila salah. That is the evidence for wudu. So if anyone asks you, what is the evidence for wudu? Or if you get asked that in the test, the answer is the verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunu idha qumtum ila salah. If you stand for the prayer, then wash your face. And so on. Um, and that's also the dalil for tagtib. And that's also uh, the dalil for muwala to maintain in close sequence is um, the hadith of the lum'a, the hadith of the coin in which the Messenger وسلم, saw one of the companions who had not washed a part of his foot. And then the Messenger وسلم, commanded him to wash it again. Tayyib. Since we're talking about wudu, if we quickly talk about al ghusl, ghusl has its reasons, obviously, whether it's <coughs> Janaba, person falling into Janaba, whether it's the ending of the menstruation cycle, the menstrual cycle, or the ending of a nifas, postnatal bleeding. Tayyib. These things طبعاً, require ghusl. Ghusl means to wash one's body with water, making sure that water reaches every part of one's body. That's the meaning of al ghusl. It is of two types. Meaning, there are two ways in which a person can perform ghusl. The first type is the ghusl which is mustahab or sunnah. And its description is that a person performs wudu as normal, goes into the shower and then pours water over himself or herself. Starting from the right, three times, and then making sure that the water reaches every limb, or every part of the body. That's the ghusl which is sunnah. Inshallah, we'll see it in more depth in some of the other books. The second type of ghusl is the ghusl which uh, suffices. The ghusl which suffices. Tab'ani is less in reward than the first one, lakin it suffices and it, it's okay for a person to perform it and then start to start praying, and the person becomes dahi with it. And that wudu, or the descript, its description is that a person pours water over himself or herself. Now a person pours water over themselves. While washing taban, the mouth, rinsing out the mouth and the nose. In no particular order, just going into the bath and making sure that everything becomes wet. That's the second type of ghusl. Um, the shaykh is now going to move on to the things which nullify the wudu. Where does shaykh say that? Ah, wa wajibu tasmiyat al dhikr. Al dhikr, ma'a dhikr. Tayyib, the shaykh mentions al wudu. The shaykh mentions saying bismillah before performing the wudu. It is permissible to say. Bismillah before the wudu. Some of the scholars mention that the hadith in which the Prophet said uh, the one that doesn't there's no wudu for the one that doesn't say Bismillah. Some scholars say that hadith is weak. Um, therefore, it hasn't reached or it can't be called a wajib. Also, if you look into those that describe the wudu of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, more than thirty companions, they never once mention. That the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Bismillah. Lakin al aqal is permissible to say Bismillah because with anything a person would say Bismillah before they eat, before they do anything, any sort of vice or anything, they would always say Bismillah. And wudu is another type of ibadah which is also um, permissible to say Bismillah and is mustahab. That's the qawl of jumhur al ulama. But it's not wajib. Tayyip. The Shaykh now is going to mention the things that nullify wudu. The things that break a person's wudu. 
He's going to mention about eight or so. And obviously in most of them, as you've gathered with fiqh, there's difference of opinion. Some of them we shall see that the stronger opinion is that they do not actually break the wudu. Go on. وَنَوَاقِبُهُمْ وَنَوَاقِبُهُ ثَمَانِيَةُ الْخَارِجُ مِنَ السَّبِيلَيْنِ وَالْخَارِجُ الْفَاحِشُ النَّجِسُ مِنَ الْجَسَدِ Say in Arabic, isn't it? Yeah, I saw it in English. Uh, the things that nullify nawaqib, the ablutions are eight. Now start to write these down one by one. Go on. Uh, the things that nullify uh, the nawaqib, the, the things that nullify the ablution are eight. Uh, water that comes out from the two private parts, or anything that comes out from the two private parts. Any foul, impure substance that comes for, out from the body. Hold on. What's the set? Yeah, and you're taking it down, sir. The first one being. Water coming about. No, no, not water. Anything, that, anything that comes out of the two private parts. Whatever comes out, yeah. The second one. Any foul, impure substance that comes out from the body. Such as vomiting. The third one. Loss of consciousness. Loss of consciousness. The fourth one. Touching a woman with a sexual desire. Say it again. Touching a woman with sexual desire. That's the fourth one that the Sheikh mentions. And the fifth one. Touching one's private part with the hand, whether it's the frontal or the real private part. Tayyip. That's the fifth one. The sixth one. Eating, uh, eating the meat of camels. Camel's meat, taban. Taib. The sixth one? Seventh. Uh, seven, seventh. Bathing a diseased person. And the washing of diseased person. Washing a diseased person. Meaning the person who has died, if you wash a person who has died, then the Sheikh is saying that you need to perform wudu from it and it breaks the wudu. Go on. Uh, the eighth is apostating from Islam. Allah protect us from that. Amen. And that is the eighth one, sir. Or the seventh one? Eighth, that's the last one. Eighth one. Okay. And some of these things, are in, all, in most of them, there's a difference of opinion. Like here we'll be mentioning, in quick summary, without Taba'an mentioning the evidences for it in too much in detail. Because the Kitab of Taba'an is summarized, so we'll keep it summarized. The first one, Al-Khayyaj min al Anything that comes out of the private parts. Anything that comes out of the private parts causes a person to lose their wudu. And the things that come out of the private parts, number one, number two, medhi, many, wadi, menses, postnatal bleeding, istihada. All of these things come out of the private parts of the human being, male or female. They nullify one's wudu. The evidence is the prophet, statement of the Prophet ﷺ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept the wudu, uh, the salah of any one of you if they fall into hadith. Hadith is these things that we've just mentioned, unless they perform the wudu. So if any in this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Sahih Hadith Sahih. If anyone falls into these things, or the things that nullify, or that come out of the private parts of the human, then they need to make wudu, or their salah will not be accepted, as the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in that hadith. That's the first one, and that is muttafiq alayhi. There is no khilaf in that. What is the second one? Hold on, don't say it. What is the second one? Ah. Huh? Out of the body. The meaning of that is if a person, for example, vomits. Taban, out of the body, excluding the two private parts. The mouth, for example, the nose, or if a person has a wound or gash or anything in his body. For example, if a lot of blood comes out, if he's had an injury and a lot of blood comes out, does blood nullify wudu? Uh, does vomiting nullify one's wudu? The stronger opinion is that it does not nullify the wudu. Anything, any foul substance that comes out of the body does not nullify wudu. Vomiting, blood coming out from any other place other than the private parts, taban, it does not nullify the wudu. The evidence 
is the lack of evidence. Because when we say that something nullifies wudu, we have to have evidence for it, sah? Tayyib. So cross that one out. How many have we got so far? Seven. Seven. When we started again, when we said the Khayyad Mun Sibilain, anything that comes out of private parts, count that as one. The second one was what? Najasa that comes out of the body, other than Daba and the private parts. That is not a naqid, or that doesn't nullify the wudu. So wipe that one out. Cross that one out. Tayyib. Zawal al aql. Zawal al aql. Loss of consciousness. Such as a person who is asleep, falling into deep sleep, or someone becoming drunk. As the hadith said that we came past, Wufi al qalam an thalatha. That the pen has been lifted from three. The person that is asleep until they wake up. Or the person that is insane. And this is a naqid. And it nullifies the wudu. If a person loses consciousness. The reason is because during that time, they may have fallen into something which breaks their wudu. So, if a person uh, is asleep, they can pass wind, sah? Or anything else, while they are asleep. So losing consciousness, falling asleep, or becoming drunk or intoxicated with anything else, causes a person to lose their wudu. Because they do not know what they are doing. Taban sleep is of two types. There's heavy sleep, and there's light sleep. For example, if a person is on a bus, and they keep... And you fall in asleep, or their head keeps going down, and they are tired. They can still comprehend everything that's going around them. Hence, when they reach their stop, they automatically get up, sah. Or if they feel their phone vibrating in their pocket or ringing, they'll pick it up. So that type of sleep, even though it is sleep, like in it doesn't break one's wudu. Like in the wudu that breaks, the, the sleep that breaks one's wudu is the deep sleep. Whereby a person doesn't know anything that's going on around them. How many things have we got that break the wudu so far? Two. The first one? Khaj min sabilain. Anything comes out of private parts. And the second one? Zal aql. Losing consciousness. The next one? What's the fourth one that we wrote down on the list? That the Sheikh mentions Masul Shahwa. The meaning of that is that a person touches a female with sexual desire. The Sheikh says that that breaks the wudu. In some in summary, the stronger opinion is that it doesn't break the wudu. Due to the lack of evidence proving uh, that the person who touches a woman has to perform wudu. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in more than one occasion, would touch his wives and then go out to the masjid, or even in the same room when the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is praying, asking Aisha radiallahu anha when he's performing salah, tahajjud, whenever he would be doing sujood, he likes or touch Aisha for her to move her feet or cross her legs so that he can perform sujood, and that and that did not break the wudu. Just like it didn't break the salah or the prayer of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, like that is common amongst um, the Shafi'iyah. That's the opinion of the Shafi'iyah in the Madhab of Shafi'i. That's why a lot of times you probably find the elders um, who follow the Shafi'i Madhab when they give a salam to a non-mahram, they'll go like that, and with their hijab. That doesn't suffice. Obviously, it's haram to be touching someone who's a non-mahram. But on top of that, like, and it doesn't break the wudu. It doesn't break the wudu. Whether you do it with a, with a ha'il, with a hijab or anything, or whether you just touch it straight, then it doesn't break the wudu. So cross that one out. Awla mustumun nisa, the verse. Awla mustumun nisa, al jama'. The meaning is al jama'. Intercourse. Tayyib. 
How many have we crossed out so far? Huh? Two. And how many have we left? Two. Yani two things break the wudu and two things don't break the wudu from the list that the Sheikh mentions. Uh, with the next one. Um, <coughs> Uh, eating uh, eat. the Muslim Fajr. Oh, yeah. Um, Touching the private parts private part. without Taban, a ha'il or something, uh, a hijab or anything, or cover. The plain private part. This is a Taban, a masala, an issue that the scholars differ over. And the, the, diff, the, the khilaf is quite strong. It's not like the khilaf of touching the, the last one, Muslim Maga, touching the woman breaking the wudu. It's a stronger khilaf. Because there are a hadith in, in which the Messenger of Allah said, The one that touches his private parts, commanding the messengers, the commanding the Muslims to wash or perform wudu if they touch their private parts. But then there are other a hadith which mention Hal huwa illa bud'atun mink. In which a man came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked him what happens if a man touches his private parts during Salah and then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, is it not a part of you? It is, is it not a limb from your limbs? So the ahadith are quite strong relating to the issue. There are two opinions. The first opinion, as the Sheikh mentioned, Rahmatullah Alayhi, that it nullifies the wudu. Like if we say it nullifies the wudu, it means that we haven't implemented the hadith in which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, is it not a limb? Meaning, if you was to touch your face, your wudu will not break, sah? If you touch your hand, your wudu will not break. Likewise, as the Messenger referred to, if you touch your private parts, it is only a limb from you. The second opinion is that it does not break the wudu, like it is sunnah to perform the wudu. If a person, afwan, if a person touches his private parts due to shahwa, then the wudu is nullified. If a person touches their private part or private parts due to shahwa, then their wudu is nullified. Allahu A'lan Lakin, it seems like in that opinion, you've implemented both evidences. If the Messenger وسلم, said, Man masa tawadda, the one that touches his private parts, let him perform wudu, by saying it's sunnah to perform wudu, you've implemented that hadith. Also, the hadith which messen- which the, in which the Messenger وسلم, said, it is, a part, is it not a part of you? You've also implemented that. That's why the scholars, a lot of scholars, say that if a person touches his private parts due to shahwa, then his wudu is nullified and he has to perform wudu. If not, then it becomes sunnah. And based upon that opinion, and that's the Allah Alam to say stronger, like a stronger opinion, stronger opinion, which a lot of scholars um, adopt. Based on that opinion, if a person is changing the nappy of a small baby, they do not need to perform wudu. Because obviously when a person is changing the nappy of a child, they do not do it due to shahwa. Sah? They do not do it due to shahwa. Therefore, if a person changes the diapers, the nappies of a child, their wudu is still intact and they don't need to perform wudu again. So we've taken that one out as well, sah? How many have we got now? How many things nullify one's wudu? Three, huh? Let me take it out as well. Three down. How many things break the wudu? Two. First one, Kharij bin Sabin, anything comes out of the private part. Second one, Zawal al-Aql. Tayyib. Carry on. What was the. Wa aklu al-lahmi al-jazul. Or lahm al-ibl. Eating the camel's meat. That breaks the wudu of the Muslim. In two hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked. One hadith, the Messenger was asked, and the tawatu'um al-lahm al-ibl. Should we make perform wudu from the meat of the camel? The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Naam. In another hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Tawatu'u min luhum al-ibl. Make perform wudu from the meat of the camel. The meat of the camel. That excludes the kidneys, that excludes the maraq, 
that excludes um, the camel's milk. These things do not break the wudu. Lakin it's the meat that breaks the wudu. What's taqsimu mayit? And washing, uh, washing the deceased person. And the, the person who's dead is wajib to wash him. Alhamdulillah. Lakin it's the person that's washing him. Does he break his wudu or not? That is the issue that the Shaykh is referring to. And the stronger opinion is that it does not break the wudu. Lakin it's sunnah to make an it's sunnah to make wudu due to a hadith, two narrations that we have from Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar said that we used to bury our dead and we, some of us used to perform ghusl, some of us used to perform wudu and some of us never used to perform wudu. Tayyip. And also Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he also mentioned that he said that your dead people or your deceased are not Najas, Najasa, they're not Najis, they're not filthy. So that doesn't break the wudu. What's the last one? Huh? Yeah, huh? Yeah, huh? A ridda. Apostating, wal'iyadu billah. Apostating from the religion of Islam. Um, to be honest, whether we say ridda nullifies one's wudu or it does not, it really makes no difference. Reason being because a ridda or apostating, it nullifies that which is greater than wudu, such as the iman of a person. Such as the iman of a person. And also, if a person does disbelief, becomes a murtad, if they do intend to say the shahadatain again and come back into Islam, then they should perform al ghusl. So there's no yani, difference whether we say that a ridda nullifies the wudu or not, there's no benefit to it. Reason being, if a person doesn't come back to Islam, then all of their actions are nullified. If a person dies on kufr, then all of their actions are nullified, won't be accepted. If a person does decide to come back to Islam, then they should perform wusl. So the previous wudu won't benefit them anyway. Tayyip. How many things did we mention that how many things break the wudu from the seven or eight things that the Sheikh mentioned? Four. Four. First one being? Khalid bin Sabilayn. Khalid bin Sabilayn. Anything that comes out of the private parts. Second one? Sorry, that. Uh, I think I come from uh, any, any foul wudu. La, la. Any foul no, substance, we said that doesn't break the wudu. Doesn't break, yeah? doesn't break the wudu. Oh, yes, I've got four cross there. Nah. So cross them out. The first one, anything that comes out of private parts, be it wherever it be. The second one, Zawal al-Aql, losing consciousness, loss of consciousness. Why? Because the person doesn't know what he's doing. The third one, Akul lahm naam, eating camel's meat. And the fourth one, just add it as Ridda, apostating from al-Islam. Taban, they are the things that nullify a person's wudu. And there's an important issue which is quite, يعني, it's worth mentioning. And Taban, because the Sheikh is, or the book is summarized, the Sheikh doesn't mention it. It's the wiping of the socks. Since we're in winter, many of us are probably going to be wiping over their socks. And wiping over the socks is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the hadith relating to wiping of the, the wiping of the socks are mutawatir, meaning there's many chains of narrations. And the scholars mention it in the books of Aqidah. Because it is a difference between Ahl Sunnah and Ahl Bid'ah. A lot of Ahl Bid'ah do not wipe their socks. Like the Shia, they wipe their feet, not their socks. And the Khawarij likewise. That's why the scholars mention it in their book. In their books. We want to know certain things such as, is it better to wipe the socks? Yani write these questions down. The first question, can we only wipe due to a necessity? The first question, can we only wipe due to a necessity?
The answer, no. A person may wipe when and how they wish. And the reason why I mention that question is because some people say you can't wipe because if you're if you're a resident and you're living in your city and you're you're not travelling, then you can't wipe over your socks. Like in that is wrong. Because the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa used to wipe over his socks while he was resident and also while he was travelling. And he said to Mughira ibn Shu'bah when he tried to wash his feet or give him water to wash his feet, Da'uhuma fa'ini adkhaltuhuma tahiratain. Leave it alone or leave them alone. I do not need water. I put them on while being on tahara. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wipe at all times, not due to a necessity only. The second question, which one is better? To wipe the socks or to wash your feet? No. Which is better, to wipe your socks or to wipe over the socks or to <coughs> wash your feet? I'll explain the answer and you can write it in your own word. In short, we can't say that this is better nor this is better. It depends on whichever state you're in. So for example, if you're at home and you find yourself not wearing socks, then it's better to, and you want to perform wudu, then it's better to wash your feet. Likewise, if you find yourself wanting to perform wudu and you've already got socks on, then it's better to wipe over your socks. The evidence that the Prophet ﷺ never used to go out of his way in order to wipe وسلم, or to wash. In whichever hal he was in, whichever situation he found himself, then he would do that which was deserving. So if he was had his feet on, if he had his shoe socks on, then he would wipe over his socks. If he didn't have his socks on, then he would wash his feet. But if you're in a place where People do not know the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or the sunnah, the fact that wiping over the socks is a sunnah. Then it may be better to wipe over the socks. If you're in a place where people do not know the sunnah of wiping over the socks, it may be better to wipe the socks, to wipe over your socks, in order to show them that this is from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, the next question, the conditions of wiping over the socks. Any questions that you may have, write them, and then inshallah, we'll look at in the end. Uh, five, uh, two minutes, we've got them in, and then questions. The first condition that a person has to put them on while being pure. Meaning, while already having wudu, they should put these socks on, put their socks on. So if a person, for example, wakes up in the morning without socks, they can't go pick up a pair of socks, put them on, and then wipe over these socks. Because you need to be on tahara, you need to be on full tahara before putting on the socks. The second one is that you can only wipe if you need to perform wudu. Whereas if you need to perform ghusl, then you should take them off. Because ghusl requires you to wash every limb, every part of your body. The third condition is that you remain within the designated time. For a traveler, 20, uh, 72 hours, three days for the traveler. As for the person who is resident who is not traveling, 24 Hours. Okay. The next question. 
When does the time of the wiping start? We said the person that's not traveling like us right now, we've got how long? 24 hours. When do these 24 hours start? The answer is the first wiping or the first time you wipe the socks after breaking your wudu. The first time of wiping your sock wiping the socks after breaking your wudu. So for example, if a person performed salat woke up for Salat al Fajr, washed his feet as normal, you washed your feet as normal, and then you put your socks on. Went to the masjid, came back. You broke your wudu at eight o'clock, for example. Then immediately you renewed your wudu at eight o'clock, and then you wiped over your socks. That's the time that your twenty-four hours starts. So it doesn't start the time that you put your socks on, nor does it start the time that you break your wudu. Now can it starts the first time you wipe over your socks after that I'm breaking your wudu. There are several other things relating to al Mas'al al khufain Inshallah, hopefully we'll discuss it in the next lesson and we'll carry on from there. Since there's five minutes left, we'll leave that for any questions and answers. Wabillahi tawfiq. Sisters, write your question down. Yeah, that's a good question. The scholars in the books of fiqh, the question is can a person wipe over ankle socks? From the conditions that the scholars mention for wiping over the socks is that they cover the foot completely right up until يعني, above the ankles. Now, uh, ankle socks or trainer socks, they do not cover the full limb. They do not cover the foot. So a lot of scholars give the fatwa that it is not permissible to wipe <coughs> over them, ankle socks. If the socks has a big hole, it doesn't matter. As long as it can be called socks. As long as it can be called socks. Whether they are loose, whether they are see-through, as long as you can call them socks, even if they're very thin, as long as you can call them socks, then you can perform wudu over it. Because the Sahaba weren't, I mean, some of them had socks that were ripped. Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim. And the Prophet sallallahu never prevent, prevented them from performing wudu. If you wear two socks, you can wipe over both of them. But, na'am, on top of each other, sah? If, you, if you've got two socks on, either you've put both socks on at the same time, or you've put them on at different times. Say, for example, you've performed the wudu now, with your washing your feet, and then you put two socks on. You can wipe over those two socks for the duration of the 24 hours. But, if you put on one pair of socks, carry on, you break your wudu, and then you wipe over that one pair of socks, then a few hours later you put another sock on top of it, or two pairs of socks on top of them, you may not wipe over the top pair. You can only wipe over the, top, uh, the bottom pair. Meaning you can only wipe over the pair that was washed, that was wiped previously. So it's okay to wipe over two socks, but it has to be the, wipe, the one that was wiped beforehand. Um, yeah, Ask them if they've got questions. Just as if you've got any questions, if you can pass them uh, to the front table, table or something. Huh? La, if you're accountable for what you Are you accountable for what you do not know? Like if a person doesn't know something, uh, then obviously they can't be held accountable. Allah Jalla wa'ala says, but Allah says we're not ones that are going to punish until we send a Rasul. So if a person, 
if a person doesn't know the ruling of a certain act and he falls into it, then inshallah they will be forgiven as long as they do not know. That's called Udhu bil Jahl. If a person doesn't know it, the ruling of an act, they shall be forgiven. When you're in the toilet, and the toilet is there, we have now where you've got the bath, you've got the sink, and you've got the when the person is actually sitting on the toilet. That and when you're sitting on the toilet, you, you do not mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like if you're performing wudu next to it, or in the bath, then it's okay, you can perform, say bismillah. Let me just quickly. Does removing the white socks break the wudu? That's an issue, that's a question from the sisters. Um, Hopefully we'll discuss it next week. Like, you know, I've noticed all of the, a lot of the knowledge-based questions that the scholars have a lot of differences. I always find them coming from sisters, mashallah. <laughs> like, it, uh, removing the socks doesn't wipe the, that doesn't break the wudu. So, for, for example, if a person wipes over their socks and they're on full wudu, then they take the socks off. They do, it does not nullify the wudu. And the, Example of it is, for example, if someone was to wipe over their head and then a few minutes later shave, shave the head, then we don't say that your wudu is nullified because you shaved your head. Like in, the wudu is um, correct. When changing the baby's nappy, doesn't the thing that comes out on the pure? The question is, when, the, when changing the baby's nappy, doesn't the thing that comes out become impure, therefore nullify the wudu? Uh, relating to the topic of if a person touches najasa or changes the child's nappy, then it doesn't break your wudu. Because even if you touch an impure substance, if you touch urine which is there, if you touch the urine is impure, طبعًا. it's a najasa. Even if you touch the urine, it doesn't nullify your wudu. Yes, it's disgusting lacking. Even if you touch something which is najasa, then it doesn't break your wudu. Changing the child's nappy does not also break the wudu. Uh, in the order of wudu, in the order of wudu, if someone realizes they forgot to wash somewhere, should they start again? No, if we say that condition, if we say that uh, wiping or the washing of these four limbs have to be done in order, then if the person forgets the order, then they should start again. For example, if a person starts with wiping the head while forgetting to wash the face or the hands, they should go back, wash the face, then the hands, then the head, then wash the feet. But that is with regards to the four limbs. As for if a person washes his left hand before his right hand, then that is okay. They, they do not need to repeat it. With regards to the hadith where the woman asked if her child can go to hajj, is the hajj for him, yani will be here, will be rewarded. How do we know that this did not count as her hajj? Uh, well, she, the, the question was, she asked the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ali hadha hajj, is there hajj for this one? So, she wasn't asking the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about her hajj. But given the fact that she was there, it must mean that she was performing hajj. But it's the question that she was asking the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Is there hajj? Meaning is there reward for this small child? So her hajj inshallah will be correct because she was probably performing hajj given the fact that she's there in the first place. A question? Anytime you want. It's authentically narrated from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he performed wudu once, performed wudu twice, and perform the wudu three times, thrice. So a person can perform that as he pleases. For example, if the water is very cold and he only wants to wash it once, it's okay. Does he have, Afan, just in addition to that, does he have to um, do, if he starts to do it three times, 
for each limb mm. they have to do it all the time. No, no, it's uh, referring to the narrator from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he performed would wash the hands once, face twice and so on. Okay. So it's not necessary that he keeps the same amount all the time. <coughs> if a sister has a discharge and it is constant and you know, it doesn't stop, does she have to keep making the wudu for every prayer or can she keep it? <laughs> The discharge that keeps coming out is called istihada, damal istihada, which is abnormal bleeding, uh, prolonged bleeding, or called, it's also called vaginal bleeding. If that does happen, then she has to perform wudu for the act that she wants to do. For example, if it's salat al now, if salat al starts at 12 and finishes at 2 o'clock, and she wants to pray dhuhr, she has to wait for the time of the salat to come in, meaning 12 o'clock. Then she performs Wudu. Then she carries on praying. Adi is normal. Even if the discharge is coming out. Then she carries on praying as normal. Like when the time for the next prayer comes, Asr, she must perform Wudu for Asr as well. Likewise, Maqrib and Asr and so on. And now there's an important issue to do with that as well. We see it at the time of the Salah. This is the need to make wudu as women hijab and can't take it off due to non-mahram present. Can she wipe over the hijab? So on for and so on for the arms. If a sister needs to make wudu and is wearing hijab and can't take it off due to a non-mahram being present, can she wipe over the hijab and so on for the arms? In authentic hadith Um Salama, I believe it's Um Salama, she mentioned or she done the wiping of the khimar. The hijab. She's done the wiping of the hijab. So if there's a non-mahram, or even if there isn't a non-mahram, and it's difficult for the sisters to take it off, then she may wipe over the khimag. And that's something which is specific to the madhab of the hanabila. It's called mufradat al-hanabila. If a sister needs to make... As for the arms, la, the arms she needs to wash. Yeah. Can you speak when making wudu? Naam, you can speak when making wudu Also when making ghusl But obviously the person needs to make When making ghusl you'd be taking a shower But if you're making wudu You can be talking Naam, for example someone can be standing there Someone there, they can be talking while making wudu And it's also not a condition that a person covers their awr during wudu is the wudu of someone who has tattoos in the areas where wudu is performed accepted? Is the wudu of someone who has tattoos in the area where wudu is performed accepted? That means if a person embraces Islam, reverts to Islam, and um, everything that preceded, inshallah, will be forgiven, and the fact that they can't take the tattoo off, then they will have no sin, and they can also perform their wudu as normal. As for if a person was a Muslim, and he knew tattoos was haram, and then he still performed the tattoo, done the tattoo, then they may be getting a sin, for disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and changing his creation and putting the tattoo there, like in their wudu, it will be correct because they can't change it. It's not something that they can change straight away. Paint, you can wipe off. Uh, paint, you can wipe off. Nail varnish, you can wipe off. Like in tattoo, it's quite expensive to take it off. Naam, if it's clean. As long as the water is clean. Two One second, sorry. Like two questions from uh, the live feed. Uh, what are the conditions of wiping over a head cover, like an imama? And also, if you break wind when making wudu or while making wudu, should one restart, restart the wudu? No, for, for imama, the conditions for imama is that it is firmly tied on, not like this. This is loose. Like in, you know, like the Sudanis have it, and sometimes we see jama'at al tabliq the way they do their turban. That is the turban that can be wiped over. Either wipe over the turban or wipe over a part of the head and wipe over the imama. Like when imama is being mentioned, it's not this, the imama that what goes over. The, the second one. Uh, when a person's doing wudu, while uh, in the course of the wudu, he breaks a wind. Naam, if a person breaks his wudu while performing wudu, then they need to perform wudu again. Because his wudu is not complete. Uh, mm. If a person is doing an ibadah, for example, say you're fasting and you intend to break your wudu, after you intend to break your fast, you look for, you go to the shop to buy food 
you're intending to break your fast You go to the shop intending to buy food But you forgot your wallet So you can't buy anything The fact that you intended to break your wudu Intended to break your fast Nullifies your fast Means your fast is broken Also in Also If you go to the fridge saying No it's too, I can't cope It's too many, it's too long You go to the fridge and you can't find anything The fact that you wanted to break your wudu Nullifies your wudu Nullifies your fasting And likewise for the wudu So if a person intends to break his wudu While he's actually performing the wudu Even though he hasn't completed it Then it is nullified It's not common Like in the fuqaha they mention it Last question inshallah We are way over time What age would you encourage Quran and your daughter to cover up? Is it the same age as you start praying? Well the earlier the better the earlier the better Like if you Taban it's not wajib upon her to cover up Up until she gets to uh, The age of puberty Like in, It's about It's a way of training the child So if you get her used to wearing the hijab From the age of 3 4 5 You will find that by the time she's 7 or 8 She can't step outside the house Unless she performs hijab uh, Unless she puts the hijab on it's tried and tested, it's a reality If she puts the hijab on Or if you teach her to put the hijab on at 2 or th- at 3 or 4 or 5 By the time she's 7, she wants to put the hijab on And it, when she wants to go outside, she won't perform She won't go outside without a hijab So the earlier the better Likewise the salah In general, anything Anything in tabia Anything that you want to get the person to do The earlier the better because when they're young, they can get used to it. Such as waking up for Salat al-Fajr. If a person wakes up, or even, a fa- even fasting, the Salaf, they used to force their children to fast Yawm al-Ashura and the fast in general. Getting them used to it. And whenever they would get hungry, they give them a little toy to take their mind off it. So the earlier, the better. Like if a person waits till she's 15 and then forces it upon her, if she doesn't want to wear it, then he can't blame anyone but himself. Allah, 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 Allah,